Well, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the LSE and to this very special event, an inaugural lecture from a new colleague, Professor Andrew Street. Uh, I've chaired loads of uh, lectures at the LSE, as I was a pro-director for some time, and, but I hadn't uh, chaired an inaugural lecture, so I checked up on the internet, what's the protocol? And apparently it's custom and practice in many good universities for the new professor and for the platform party to wear academic gowns. <laughs> now at the LSE we're more or less gownless, other than the ladies. Uh, so I put a tie on. I didn't even do that. <laughs> uh, my name is George Gaskell. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor and I have a long association with colleagues in the Department of Health Policy. Uh, that's enough about me because this evening it's all about Andrew who joined the school uh, a year ago. He came from the Center of uh, Health Economics at the University of York up the road where he was director of the health policy team and director of the Economics and Social and Healthcare Research Unit which is a joint collaboration between York the University of Kent and the LSE. Between 2005 and 17, he worked on a variety of projects, including NHS productivity. His report was recognized by the uh, government as the most comprehensive and reliable estimates of productivity going. He's also worked on health uh, hospital funding integrated uh, care for older people and the use of patient reported outcome measures, PROMs, to improve health care. He served as a special advisor to the House of Commons Health and Care Committee in 2016 and the 2018 inquiry into the impact of budget on health and social care. He fits in his spare time being editor of the Journal of Health Economics, and he's also leading a new venture in the school, a very interesting and important double executive degree in health policy with the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Now, with that wealth of experience, he's in a very good position this evening to address what seems to me to be an issue of considerable relevance to all of us. Will you feel better after hospital treatment? And he's also uh, going to explain why this matters, although as I contemplated the title, I thought well, it was pretty self-evident why it matters, but there's probably a deeper uh, reason here why it matters and what can be done about it. So Andrew is going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Technology permitting this event will be a podcast. And if you are Twitter hashtagging, the uh, thing is um, hash LSE health. Is that up there? No, it isn't. So hashtag LSE health. Now, can I, can you follow my good example and turn your phones to silent? as we don't want an interruption. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present and welcome to the school of the year. I'm turning off. Thank you very much. Great. Look, thank you ever so much, everybody, for coming tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all to LSE. I'm going to start by um, saying a little bit about myself to kick off. So um, my first degree my, as an undergraduate was in philosophy and economics, which I did at uh, University College London, which is just up the road. It wasn't a particularly vocational qualification, so when I finished... I um, did a variety of odd jobs. I was a gardener for a while in Regent's Park. And, um, and I also worked as a cycle courier. 
And this was in the days when cycling in London was fairly hazardous. Uh, so there were no things, such things as bicycle helmets. There were no such things as, as uh, cycle lanes. I got knocked off once or twice. And I realised, cycling through the rain in February, that um, the occupational hazard um, associated with my life expectancy was pretty, pretty low. So I probably wasn't going to be on this earth for very, very long. And my family recognised that as well. So Anne and Ian, my aunt and uncle, who are here today, um, said to me, they said, perhaps you need another qualification, and suggested that I do a master's degree in health economics. Now, I'd done a, a, um, a course in health economics at UCL, taught by Gwyn Bevan, who's a wonderful professor who's now in the Department of Management here at LSE. Um, but health economics in those days was not a particularly well-known subject. In fact, the University of York was the only place that taught health economics. But my aunt knew about this. My aunt had her finger on the pulse because my aunt actually trained as a nurse. Um, and she worked as a nurse, district nurse, in some fairly rough areas in Leeds. Um, and so she knew that there was probably more demand for health economic, uh, economists than there were supply of health eco economists. And so it's proved I've managed to be gainfully employed, not as a psycho career anymore, but actually as a health economist ever since. So she got it right in terms of directing my career path. And also was on the working group of the Florence Nightingale Museum, which was being established at the time, and is now based at St. Thomas's Hospital, which is opposite the House of Commons. So if ever you want to have a little trip out sometimes, really nice museum to, to go and visit. Florence Nightingale is my all-time number one hero. I think she's absolutely amazing, and the contribution she's made to the health and well-being in her time, and actually for generations subsequently, is inestimable. Um, she was an absolutely wonderful statistician. At a time when very few people collected data or even knew how to analyse data or use evidence to influence policy. So she was one of the forerunners of the types of investigation that many of us here do these days. And she had quite a difficult time in being able to convince people to act on the basis of evidence, partly because there wasn't much knowledge in terms of data around, and there wasn't much information around in terms of conveying that information to make it interpretable. So one of the challenges she faced was how to convert all the numbers and things that she picked pulled together into something that we could understand. So she had to come up with sort of geographical uh, graphical representations for the complex associations that she um, was seeing within her data. So she came up with graphs like this. So this graph shows... So, so this graph is really quite complicated. And it's quite difficult for somebody like myself to explain quite what is going on in this graph because there's a, very lot, there's a, a lot of things happening here. So she had this challenge of to try to present her data in some graphical form, but she had an additional challenge, which was to ensure that people who saw those graphs could interpret it. And her challenge was doubly hard because this was in the 1850s and the 1860s. And of course, the people that she needed to influence were people who worked in the Houses of Commons and the House of Lords. Well, not people who worked in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, men who worked in those institutions. Women over 30 didn't get the vote until 100 years ago in this country. So Florence Nightingale wasn't allowed to vote she wasn't allowed to be a member of Parliament. Not only that, she wasn't allowed to go to Parliament to present her graphs and her reports in front of the select committees who made policy decisions 
based on the evidence that she put together. What she had to do was write those reports and then get somebody else to present them on her behalf. And sometimes she came up with graphs that were just too difficult to explain, like this one. So she simplified. So here's a simpler graph. This is one you'll be familiar with. We call it a bar graph, of course. She called it a line graph. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an early example of a sort of case control study. So what this graph shows is the death rates of English men in England matched to English soldiers, matched by age, to English soldiers serving in India. And what she showed was that whether you look at it in winter, spring, summer or autumn, the death rate of English soldiers in India was higher than the death rate of English men in England. And it wasn't because of differences in age. Nor was it because they were all at war. So when these data were being collected, there wasn't a load of fighting going on. The reason they were dying in India at a greater rate to deaths in England was because English soldiers were living in close quarters. So if anyone got sick and had some infectious disease, it was quickly transmitted around the rest of the barracks. If any of them got sick and got admitted to hospital, the way that hospitals were designed meant that contagion spread really quickly. A lot of the work that Florence Nightingale did was for the British Army, advising on how health care should be better organised, advising on how accommodation should be better organised. So she had a profound influence on some of the, what we would now call the housing impacts of health care, of, of, of people's health. So she was able to do this because she collected data. She wouldn't have been able to have these insights if she didn't have data on death rates of people serving in India and get comparable information from people living in England and then put that together in a form that is easily interpretable by the rest of the population. So a lot of the work that she did was to convince people to collect data. One of her other roles was as a manager of a hospital in London and when she arrived at that hospital, she realised that she didn't know who was in the hospital, why they were there, how long they were staying. So she created a, co a collection of model forms for which, uh, on which data for every single patient in hospital was collected. And these data were collected, she encouraged hospitals across London to collect these data. So if you look at this journal, this is the, 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 a journal called the London Statistical Society. Nowadays it's called the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. But um, in 1861 it published this article by Steele, which is basically just a description of all the patients that were treated in Guy's Hospital, which is my local hospital, between 1854 and 1861. And it has some tables in. This is my, one of my favourite tables. It basically lists the various causes of accidents of people in hospital. Before Florence Nightingale, this information wasn't collected in a systematic way. Number 21 is my favourite. Here it is. Bites of animals, two, seven dogs, two adders, This was in London in 1854 to 1860. Who knew? Who knew that there were elephants and monkeys roaming the streets of London in that time? <laughs> now, we still use this type of coding system today. You're a bit slow on the uptake, aren't you? Read the slides. We still use this sort of coding system today. We don't have 21 causes of accidents anymore. Now we have thousands of reasons why people are in hospital. We have loads of diagnosis codes, injury codes, and codes for the accidents that people have suffered. They aren't just used in London hospitals. They're used in hospitals all over the world. 
And we call those codes the International Classification of Diseases. Some countries use version 9, some 10. They basically evolved over time into an inter international classification. And there are thousands of different codes. And that is thanks to the pioneering work of Florence Nightingale. We still have bytes in this code book. So if you go to TO1.9, bites are multiple open wounds, unspecified, animal bites, cuts, lacerations, and puncture wounds. Came from that original classification number 21 in that numerical analysis in the London Statistical Society. So she encouraged hospitals in London to collect data and actually publish the data. And some of the data she collected was not just reasons why you were in hospital, but what happened to you as a result of being there. So she started to encourage hospitals to collect information on health outcomes. And she got on the forms people to fill in three types of outcomes. Whether you left the hospital dead, whether you got better, or whether you were unrelieved. So hospitals in London started to collect this data about their own patients and about the outcomes that those patients experienced as a result of their treatment in hospital. So they collected those data. Not only did they collect those data, they started to publish it. So if you look at the London Statistical Society Journal and find this article, Statistics of General Hospitals of London for 1861, you can find data about patients treated in London in 1861. The following year, she encouraged a few other hospitals to participate as well in the provinces. And you can construct graphs of mortality rates across hospitals. So all of these hospitals are still in existence today. St Bartholomew's, Guy's, St Thomas's, York, where I used to be based, uh, Stockport, King's Royal Free. So these were the mortality rates across these hospitals in 1862. They're a bit different. So those were published in 1861, they were published in 1862, and every year until 1865. And then publication ceased. And it ceased because of the people who worked in this building. Do you recognize this building, anyone? This is one of the buildings around the corner that LSE has got its eye on. Or it actually might have its claws in already, right? I'm not sure. This is the Royal College of Surgeons. Just around the corner. So the people in there, the men in there, because of course you, you couldn't be a member of the Royal Colleges in the 1850s and 1860s unless you were a man, decided when these publications were happening that they needed to form a committee. So they put together a committee just to see how this publication malarkey was working and then they reported on Florence Nightingale's scheme to put, collect data and put it in the public domain. And they reported adversely on this scheme. And they said, it's too costly to collect this data, these data and it's too costly to put it together and make it available to the public. It's also difficult to ensure that we've got like-for-like like comparisons. Patients in some hospitals might be quite different from patients in another hospital. So if we're comparing the two, that's not fair, because you're not comparing like with like. Unlike on your previous line graph, where you did a bit of matching, here, patients are different. And as a result, we've got higher death rates, not because we're not very good at caring for people, but because patients are sicker, or in some way different to start with, and you've not taken that into account. And as a consequence, publication ceased, because it was too costly, and we didn't do proper risk adjustment. Those were the reasons that the Royal College of Surgeons gave to say we shouldn't be publishing anymore. Now, that wasn't the real reason. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the real reason was until the very end of the talk. But if you can think about it, in the meantime, that's a little puzzle for you. Publication of these data, mortality rates across English hospitals, stopped in 1865, and it didn't start again for many, many years afterwards. 
And it didn't start again until there was a tragedy. And that was a tragedy that happened at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Now, at the time, the inquiry into what happened in the Bristol Royal Infirmary was the most expensive inquiry that took place in England. And it was an inquiry into the deaths of children. Between 1991 and 1995, it was estimated that about 30 to 35 children had died at the Bristol Royal Infirmary, um, having had open heart surgery, 30 to 35 more than would be expected given the nature of the condition that they had and the characteristics of the children who were being treated. Many more children were severely injured at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. They weren't the subject of the inquiry, which only focused on the deaths, but many children and their families suffered trauma as a result of what was found to be extremely poor medical practice in the Bristol Royal Infirmary. And I wrote a paper on this because I did a master's degree in politics as well, and as a result of that I published a paper, uh, studied this in my politics master's degree and published it in this journal here, which shows that some of you who are doing your master's degrees might be able to convert your papers into publications afterwards. Okay, so if you want to follow up, there's a story about it in there. What they found was severe medical malpractice by the, the consultant team that were caring for these people. And what, the, what had been relied on in the past to detect and, and resolve medical malpractice was the institutions within the hospital, dominantly the medical director. The problem was the medical director was the person performing the operations. So essentially, this system of self-assessment failed. It failed tragically. It failed children and families who have suffered irreparable damage as a consequence of a failure of the medical profession to regulate itself. Now, the government responded to this inquiry by saying, among other things, we should be making available information about mortality rates across all hospitals. And as a consequence of this tragedy, the government insisted that the medical profession should start publishing data on hospital mortality rates. Now, this has happened before. In the United States, in, um, in, uh, in New York, there had been some data around about um, mortality rates collected by cardiac surgeons, which they shared amongst themselves. And the New York Times got hold of this data and decided, through a freedom of information request and said, we're going to publish it because it might be important information for you cardiac surgeons to know about, but actually it's quite important for patients to know what the difference in mortality risk is if they're contemplating having some sort of cardiac surgery. So the New York Times got hold of these data and published it in the newspaper. And there was a consequence. The consequence was, as a result of making these report cards publicly available, mortality rates started to fall. The problem was, doctors became more selective about who they treated for surgery. So essentially, they decided to select lower risk patients. And that's because these report cards didn't do good risk, risk adjustment. Just like the Royal College of Surgeons had said in the 1850s and 1860s, you cannot secure actual rather than simply apparent comparison. This was the problem here as well. The risk adjustment wasn't good enough. We weren't comparing like for like. And because we weren't comparing like for like, surgeons in New York State changed their behavior, which also was to the disadvantage of patients who might well have needed to have some form of cardiac surgery. Now they were being said, we won't treat you. Now, in England and the UK, we learned from that experience. So the Society for um, Cardiothoracic Surgery in Great Britain and Ireland knew about the New York experience when they had been told 
by the government that we need now to make these data available. And they said, we need to do really good risk adjustment. We need to take account of the differences that patients have before we compare how well each surgeon is doing. So they invested a lot of time and energy into risk adjustment and published risk-adjusted mortality rates for all coronary artery bypass grafting for all 30 surgeons that were operating in Great Britain and Ireland over an eight-year period. And as a result of publication, there were fewer deaths, as in New York, and there was no risk selection. Because the cardiothoracic surgeons realised that this was properly taken into account in the risk adjustment methodology in which they had participated. So they didn't change their behaviour adversely by selecting which patients to treat and which not to treat. So that was good. And the government saw that for the cardiothoracic surgeons and decided what we need to do is roll this out from cardiothoracic surgeons across all doctors. So this is my mum. Now, two years ago, my mum was going to have a knee replacement, or she was contemplating having a knee replacement, and she was really anxious about it. So she asked me, does my doctor know what he's doing? It was a he. And I thought, oh, I can answer that question because I can go on the internet and find out. So I did that. This was my mum's doctor, Mr. David Duffy. So I was able to look him up on the internet because she'd been told by her GP, this is the doctor that's going to uh, operate on you. And on his own personal website, there's a bit of detail about him. He's done some uh, time in Australia. He's worked in Australia for a while. Uh, he specialises on sport. He specialises in sport injuries. Not particularly interesting for my mother. But he also specialises in knee replacement surgery. So the GP at least is referred to the right sort of person, given my mum's problem. Of course, I can find out more about... Mr. David Nuffy, because I can dive into a bit more detail about him and his practice. If I look at the National Joint Registry, and the National Joint Registry um, shows details for all orthopaedic surgeons operating in the United Kingdom over the last year and the last three years. So I can find a profile for Mr. David Duffy. And this is what it shows. Over the last three years, this is what Mr. David Duffy has been doing. A little bar chart, um, a pie chart detailing how many operations he's done. He's done a variety of things. He's done knee replacement, knee revisions, hip revisions and hip replacements. The predominant thing he's done is knee replacements. That's what my mum's had, having. Not only has he done knee replacements, he's done a lot of them. So he's done... 278 knee replacements over the last three years. Now that's, that's really good news. Because I don't want my mum to be treated by somebody for whom it's the first knee replacement that they've done, right? I mean, it's going to have to be someone, sorry, but I don't want it to be my mum. <laughs> so this, this doctor has done a lot in the last three years. Twice the national average. So he knows what he's doing. So I could answer my mum. I know, I'm pretty sure that this doctor knows what he's doing because you're not the first. There's many more patients who've had knee replacements that he has treated. I can tell her more than that, actually. It also shows what the mortality rate is for all doctors doing knee replacements. And they put this together in what's called a funnel plot. The mortality rate following knee replacement Thankfully, these days, it wasn't the case in the 1850s, nowadays it's pretty low. And of course, you want to survive your treatment, right? It's not enough that he's done 278 knee replacements in the last three years. If they've, all those patients have died, don't go there. <laughs> so this shows the mortality rate for Mr. David Duffy. If you're outside this upper band here, 
don't go there. This is the national average, this is below the national average. Mr David Duffy keeps people alive. So I could say to my mum, he knows what he's doing, and probably you're going to live to tell the tale. Which reassured her. So then my mum said, because she always got another question after the first one, then my mum said, I'm going to have this operation. I'm really sore. My knee hurts. Will I feel any better as a result of having it? It's quite a lot to have a knee replacement, right? My mum's quite old. It's quite a bit to undergo. And she was anxious that afterwards it wouldn't be worth it. Her pain wouldn't go. She still would be, would be, wouldn't be particularly mobile. And I thought, how shall I answer this? Well, I'm a health economist. What I could do is I could do a quick systematic review of the literature and see whether knee replacement makes people better. There must be some randomised clinical trials that have been conducted into this very question. So I thought, let's do that. But there's three problems with that, looking at the clinical trial literature, literature on, on knee replacements. First of all, most clinical trials report an average effect for people in one arm of the trial and people in the other arm of the trial, which is fine. We want to compare whether one thing is better than another of people who have, could have had either intervention. So we can find the average effect. The problem is, my mum isn't average. She's going to be different. She's going to be at one extreme or another of the distribution. So just looking at an average effect, I wouldn't be able to assure her that on average, on average, people who've had a knee replacement seem to be fine. And she'd say, yeah, but I'm not average. The other problem is, of course, people who get recruited to clinical trials are very particular people. They usually get excluded from clinical trials if they have any other comorbidities, if they've had heart problems if they've got diabetes, if they've got any other healthcare problems. Most people my mother's age have multimorbidity. And my mum's one of them. She just wouldn't be enrolled in a clinical trial. So a clin even if I could find a clinical trial with the sort of same age, age profile as my mother, people like my mother wouldn't be in that trial. So I can't use that. So we reassure her that people in this trial are going to, ex you're going to experience the same sort of outcome as people in this trial. And the third reason that was a problem is nobody does clinical trials of knee replacements. So I can't go to the, I can't go and do a web search of the literature on this to answer her question. What do I do? I said to her, tell you what mum, fill in a questionnaire. So I got her to fill in this questionnaire, which is called the EQ5D. And it's called the EQ5D because there are five different dimensions of health status. And we can use this for any type of uh, um, intervention. And it's been used in loads and loads of clinical trials all over the world. So I got hold of this questionnaire. I said, Mum, calm down, have a cup of tea, fill this questionnaire in. It's got these five dimensions. Mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression. And for each of those five dimensions, you have to give a score out of three. So if you look at mobility, you're asked if you have no problems getting about, some problems getting about, or you're confined to bed. So, I got her to fill that in. Now, actually, lots of people in England have been filling those forms in over the years. So we've actually got quite a lot of data about how people feel about their surgery. So, since 2009, every patient is asked to complete this questionnaire before they have surgery and then sometime afterwards, either three months afterwards or six months afterwards. And every patient having hip replacement is asked to fill it in, every patient having knee replacement, everybody having a hernia repair, everybody having varicose vein removal. So they're all asked to fill this questionnaire before they have treatment and then sometime afterwards. So what that means is we have some before and after measures. 
And what we can do then is compare how people felt before they had surgery with how they felt afterwards. So let's just take that mobility index for the first dimension. So before, you might say you had no problems running about, some problems, and you were confined to bed. Afterwards, you might say you have no problems, some problems, or you can, were confined to bed. So, what do you think happens? Well, some people don't change their status. They had no problems walking about before, which rather begs the question of why they were having hip replacement in the first place. Maybe it's fun. Fortunately, those 5% still felt that they could get about afterwards as well. Some people had some problems, they still have problems afterwards. 44% have some problems, they still have some problems. Not very many were confined to bed either before or after. Some people got better, and that's what we want. So 49% of patients who had some problems walking about before surgery, six months later said they had no problems. Great. A few said they were confined to bed, they're up and running. Some were confined to bed and they're up and walking. Some people, though, got, got, didn't get better, they got worse. So some people who were fine before they had surgery, now they've got some, some, some problems. Probably serves them right, right? <laughs> there weren't many in this category. But what we'd like to know is what explains why people move around this grid. Why do some people get better? Why do some people get worse? Why do some people stay the same? There are a number of reasons for it. People are different. So if you're treating some people, their opportunity to get better might be more limited than for other people. Some of the reasons for the difference might be because they're treated by different orthopaedic teams. So some orthopaedic teams might be great. They might have good surgeons, orthopaedic nurses, who work together really well, communicate really well, they mobilise patients really quickly after surgery, and as a consequence, patients treated by that team get better much more quickly and to a greater extent than patients treated by teams where they're not so great. We'd quite like to know. If you're going to have a knee replacement, you'd like to go to the team that's better than the team that's worse, right? Or if your mother is going through a tr that treatment. That's what we'd like to know. Well, we've got some data. We can find out. So, this shows how people change on this questionnaire before treatment and after treatment for each of the four types of condition that people have been filling in questionnaires for. So we have hip replacements here, knee replacements here, hernia repairs here, and varicose veins. And all these data show is the average response in each hospital. So each hospital treats a whole bunch of patients, and we can just take the average response, and we can summarise them across all hospitals before they had surgery and after they had surgery. And these are basically box and whisker plots. This is the average across the whole country, before, for hip replacement, the average hospital across the country, after people have ha had surgery six months later. What we can see from these diagrams are a number of things. First of all, these plots are higher than this. And that means, generally, people are saying they got better after surgery. This is better up here, this is worse. So generally, the plot moves upwards, so people get better. And that's true for hips, that's true for knees, it's true for hernias, and it's, var it's true for varicose veins. The room for improvement isn't quite so much for varicose veins and hernias, because before they have surgery, they're not saying they're as unhealthy or have such poor health status as the people who have hip replacements and knee who are going to have hip or knee replacements. The second thing that we can see is there's quite a bit of variation in responses by patients in particular hospitals. And that's shown by these little whiskers around these boxes. So the wider these whiskers, the more variation in response. Why is there that variation? Is it because patients are different in some hospitals than others? Is it because orthopaedic teams are better than others? We see that variation both before surgery 
and afterwards. And the other thing that we see is there are some outliers. These are the, those hospitals where patients, on average, are saying that they are having a much worse health status six months after surgery than other patients who've had the same surgery in other hospitals around the country. Why is that? Is it because those patients were sicker to start with? Is it because the care that they were provided with was not as good as it is elsewhere? So there's a story there. We don't know what's going on. But because we've got data, we can try to find out. So why do patient outcomes vary from one patient to another? The first thing is because patients are different. Nowadays, we can do really good risk adjustment. It's not the 1850s and 1860s anymore. Now we have really good data, anonymized data, about every patient that's treated in hospital. It's really detailed, which means that we're able to do really sophisticated risk adjustment and control for the various characteristics that patients have um, prior to having surgery and take that into account. We also know which patients went where. So we know which orthopaedic teams were treated, which treated which patients. Outcomes that patients experience might also be re related to other things that hospitals do. So hospitals are primarily there to make us better. But hospitals have other pressures on them as well. Hospitals are under pressure to main their, maintain their financial balance. They're under pressure to meet waiting time targets. They're under pressure to reduce length of stay. They're under pressure because of loads of regulatory constraints. And it may be that being under pressure to meet all these other objectives might detract them from their core business of making people better. Well, we can take that into account in our analysis using some fancy dancy econometric methods that allow us to not only take account of the different characteristics of people, but also take account of the multiple objectives that they're trying to achieve. So we can set that up in a simultaneous way. So let's magically say that we've done that and see what the results are. What we want to know is whether some orthopaedic teams are better than others. So we need some data. And we're going to do that for data for hip replacement patients for a three-year period. We've got 96,000 patients in that three-year period who filled in the questionnaire before and after across 250 hospitals and treatment centres. And we know about what they said when they filled in their questionnaire, their length of stay, their waiting times prior to admission, and whether after they were uh, discharged from hospital, they were readmitted again as a readmission as an emergency, which is not a good thing to happen to you. So all of those things matter. Now let's just take the first two. Report, patient reported outcomes and length of stay. It might be the case that patients that do better stay in hospital longer. So actually keeping in patients in hospital could be a good thing. But it could be the other way around. It could be that patients that stay in hospital for a shorter period of time do better. We don't know, but we can find out. And what you would like, if you're the regulator, would be that patients feel better and that length of stay is lower because then the hospital system is working more efficiently. Shorter length of stay, more efficient, but you only want to be, have shorter length of stay if it isn't going to be harmful to patient health. So what's the relationship? Is there a positive relationship between length of stay or a negative relationship between length of stay? Well, we can set it up in this sort of grid here. Let's suppose length of stay is a bad thing, so shorter lengths of stay are up here and longer lengths of stays are up here. Outcomes are good things. So what, where the patients say they are better, they're up this end. And what we want is just to see how patients compare on this two by two grid. So really what you want for your hospital, your orthopaedic team, is to have low length of stay and good outcomes for your patients. You don't want to be down here where patients are staying in hospital for long periods of time and reporting bad outcomes. That's not what we want for our system. Of course, there could be a trade-off between those two things. Could be that you have longer length of stay and then you get good outcomes or vice versa, in which case 
you're going to be in these grids here. Now this is pretty much what we do when we do randomised clinical trials comparing one drug to another. We compare them on costs and we compare them on outcomes and we put them on a grid and those that are in the top corner, lower costs here and better outcomes are going to be preferred to the intervention that has higher costs or poorer outcomes. Sometimes there'll be a bit of a trade-off between the two. So we haven't got two interventions or two drugs here. We've got 252. But it's basically the same idea. We have 252 hospitals that we're comparing rather than two drugs or two interventions. But we can put them on the same grid because we've got two different parameters that we're investigating. What we want to know is if the relationship's like this, in which case there's a trade-off. You get better outcomes, but you stay in hospital longer. Or it could go like this. You get better outcomes, and you have short length, shorter length of stay. What's it going to be? That's the end of the talk. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. So actually, there's a positive relationship between length of stay and outcomes. It looks like patients report better outcomes if they have shorter length of stay. That's just two outcomes. Actually, we can take into account lots of other outcomes simultaneously. So we've done that by also looking at waiting times and readmission rates. And we see the same patterns across all of these indicators, conditioning on all the other indicators. The relationship is always like this. If you do well on one thing, you do well on the other things. Hospitals that do well in terms of their patient-reported outcomes have shorter length of stay, they have shorter waiting times for, before admission to hospital, they have lower readmission rates. If you're good, you're good across the board. If you're bad, you're bad across the board. So there's a positive relationship between different outcomes. There's something else in this diagram as well. Some of the, of the hospitals in treatment center, uh, and treatment centres that we've looked at, amongst the 252, are always significantly better than the national average. There's a whole group here that are in, 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 in black whose confidence interval doesn't cross the lines in the middle. That means that they are significantly, they, their patients report significantly better outcomes and have significantly shorter lengths of stay than the national average experience across all 252 hospitals. And that's again true across the board. There are also a group of hospitals in the red zone that always seem to do worse. Now that's not due to ca the characteristics of their patients because we've done some really fancy risk adjustment. So hospitals can't say it's because our patients are different. There is something else going on in these hospitals that means that their performance across these four measures seems to be poorer than other hospitals doing the same thing and having controlled for the differences in their characteristics of the patients. So are some orthopaedic teams better than others? Well, it turns out, yes, some are. It turns out that those ones that were in the green zone were all treatment centres that only focus on care for hip replacement patients. They just do that. They specialise in treating patients who need a hip replacement. Other treatment centres have been set up that just treat patients who have knee replacements. Others just do cataracts. And they're better in all of these things. They have lower lengths of stay, they have shorter waiting times, better outcomes, lower readmissions. And this was an innovation in England that was introduced by Tony Blair from 1999, 2000, and actually had been advocated by the people who work in this building, the Royal College of Surgeons. They said in a report in, the two th in 2000 or so, we ought to separate out elective from emergency care because patients would be better off, and they've been proved right. So I published this article with my colleague, Niels Gutaka, in this journal here a few years ago. Uh, this year, in fact. Um, so if you want to follow up all the methods, just download that article. It's open access. 
So my mum said to me, I'm not going to read your journal article. Even if you're going to force it on your students, I'm not reading it. And I'm not getting treated in a treatment centre. I'm going to a hospital. So this is completely irrelevant for me. And you got me to fill in a questionnaire, and you haven't answered my question. Will I feel any better? And I said, yes, yeah, sorry, Mum. I've just been rambling on for the last 20 minutes, wasting your time, and I haven't answered your question. And I do that a lot. So I said, sorry, Mum. OK, let's answer your question. You filled in this questionnaire. And actually, lots of other people have filled this questionnaire in as well. So between 2009 and 2016, Half a million patients in England filled this questionnaire in before they had surgery and three or six months after they had surgery. And 185,000 people who had hip replacement filled it in both times, 198,000 who had knee replacement, and 115,000 who'd had groin hernia repair. I said to my mum, what we can do is see if there are any people who felt just like you before they had surgery and who were just like you, in all relevant respects, and see if they got better as a result of their surgery. Not the average knee replacement patient who filled this questionnaire, but the ones who were just like you. So we can do that by taking all the data and then allocating people to specific groups based on their characteristics of how they feel before surgery and their experience after surgery. So instead of reporting an average result, I can put people into specific groups. So the idea is to allocate patients into outcome homogenous, similar groups in terms of their post-treatment and pre-treatment outcomes. And we do this using a technique called classification and regression tree analysis. It basically works by, you take a whole bunch of data, 500,000 patients in total, or here for knee replacements, 200,000, and you split those people down into separate groups, branch by branch. Some people go down one branch, some people go down another, and at the end, you end up with one of your groups. And you split them according to your characteristics. So we split them according to their age, gender, how they felt before they had surgery, and how long they'd had symptoms. Not too many. And the reason we did this was because we did it, we put this work together with some GPs who were working in, their, in, the, in the York area, and they wanted to use this tool to be able to advise their patients about whether or not they should have surgery and what they were likely to experience as a result of surgery. And they needed to do that in a very short consultation time. So you can't add too much data in. So we just had these things that you fill in. So if you want to read this, it's in that journal. That goes in all the specific details of how we did it. But this is how it looks. Basically, you put a tree together. You have a tree like this. You water your little tree with some data. So for our knee replacements or our hip replacements, for hip replacements, we had 155,000 patients who'd filled in the data. We split those patients up down one branch or another according to these characteristics. So younger people go this way, older people go this way, people who have had symptoms who are of a particular age go this way. If they've had symptoms for a long time, they go the other way if they've had symptoms for a shorter time. And you just split them up and split them up and split them up until you get at the very end, and these are your little leaves. Okay, so that's basically how it works. We're splitting people into groups according to these characteristics, and everybody in the, say, in the end group has similar experiences as a consequence of their treatment. So we have 55 distinct groups for hip replacement, 59 for knee replacement, and 60 for hernia repair. Right. Now, you can find out for your future self, or your parents, or perhaps yourself, how you might feel if you're contemplating having a knee replacement or a hip replacement or a hernia repair. So maybe you're not going to do that, but think of somebody 
close to you who might be contemplating having one of those treatments. Go onto this website. Come on, youngsters. Get your phones out and your iPads. Come on. Go on to aftermysurgery.org.uk. Come on, Emil. <laughs> Just go into that website. Bring that up. And you get this welcome page here. And then you can select what type of treatment you're going to have. Are you going to have a hip replacement? Are you going to have a knee replacement? Are you going to have a hernia operation? You or somebody you represent. So you go into one of those screens, and if you've chosen a knee replacement or a hip replacement or a hernia repair, you'll get a screen that looks like this. It's basically a questionnaire that you have to fill in. And it's really straightforward to fill in. You basically have to fill your age in. Don't fill ridiculous ages in, of course. You know, if you're going to pick an imaginary age, pick one amongst the age of people who usually have hip replacements or knee replacements. So over 50s and so on. So don't put ridiculous ages in. Put them in amongst the age of people who usually have them. You need to put your gender in. You need to say how long you've had your symptoms, so make that up. And then, of course, you fill in the pre-treatment questionnaire. This is the EQ5D. You have to say if you've got any problems with your mobility, your self-care, usual activities, your pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression. So fill that in. All done it? Then you can hit enter, see your results, and what you'll do is you'll get a screen that looks like this for whatever you've put in. All right? So I put in some values, and the values that I put in were similar to the values that other people also had. Similar age, similar gender, similar symptom duration. They filled in the EQ5D in the same way. And of those people, 93 of them said after they'd had surgery, not six months later, 93 of them said they felt noticeably better. Some 4% said they didn't feel any different. Three said they felt worse. You can also see how you feel, feel on each of those distinct dimensions. So you can look at your mobility. Half said they had no problems walking about, but half had some problems walking about. So even though overall they say their health is better, there are still some problems in terms of your mobility. In terms of your self-care, most had no problems in terms of their self-care. So I could fill this into my, with, my, with my mum, fill her questionnaire in, and see what other people like her said they felt after surgery. And that gave her reassurance. She sort of knew how many people had felt better as a result, and she also had information about what particular dimensions of health status she might still have problems with. She might ha still have some mobility problems. Sure enough, my mum, now two years later, is not up and running marathons. But she is walking about. She doesn't complain about the pain in her knee anymore. She complains about other things, of course. <laughs> but the problems about her knee have now been resolved. And this information provided assurance to my mother to go ahead with the surgery. Because I wasn't just saying, on average, people get better. Or I wasn't just saying, well, the doctor says it's fine. I was able to say what other people, just like my mother, said as a consequence of that treatment. We have this data in England because of a tragedy. So it's great to have it. But it was really costly that this data became available to us in England. This tragedy occurred, and unfortunately, it wasn't acted on until very late. An action only took place because this magazine took up the case and put it in the public eye, private eye. Ran story after story until it got taken up by the, popular, the, the rest of the press, and eventually by politicians and the medical profession. It is not good enough that things change because journalists have to 
take up stories and put them in the public domain. It's not good enough. Something good has come out of this tragedy, but this tragedy should never have happened in the first place. And having happened, it should have been resolved by the medical profession and policymakers. It should have been picked up by them and it should have been acted upon by them, not by the press. This tragedy is not an isolated event. It's not an isolated event that is isolated to the United Kingdom. We see headlines like this around the world. There was a similar tragedy in Australia, in the Bacchus Marsh Hospital. Again, babies died unnecessarily. Finally, the medical profession and the Australian Department of Health is acting upon it and making data publicly available. We've had cover-ups in Northern Ireland. We have problems in Spain. We have medical errors in the United States. These problems happen the world over. And that is not good enough. Florence Nightingale in 1850s and 1860s said the first requirement of a hospital is that it does no harm. 170 years ago we still cannot be assured in our countries around the world that harm is not being done to vulnerable people as a result of their contact with the healthcare profession. She would be ashamed of us. We've made some steps in the right direction, but far too few. We've made some steps in England, but that's nothing to be proud of. It's only for three or four treatments. True, we now have mortality rates published and activity rates for all doctors. That's a good thing, but it isn't the end of the story. And in many countries, those data are not available even just at hospital level. And by having those data unavailable, we actually don't know whether harm is being done. We're still reliant in most countries on complaints procedures and on newspapers reporting the results and complaints of tragedies. That is not good enough in our countries around the world. There are reasons why it's not made available. The reasons why that information was not made available in the 1860s was because a committee in the Royal College of Surgeons got together and said it's too costly to get the data and you cannot do proper risk adjustment. And as a result, data were no longer made available for 160 years. Those were not the reasons. The reasons that data were not made available in 1860 was because it was not in the doctor's interests. In the 1860s, if you went to hospital, who paid? It wasn't the National Health Service, right? We didn't have a National Health Service in England in the 1860s. We didn't have a there was no National Health Service in any country in the world. There was no social health insurance system in any country in the world. If you went to hospital, you paid. Or if you died, your family paid. Now, what was happening was these data were being published. People could see the mortality rates at different hospitals and thought, you know what, I've got quite a high risk of dying if I get operated in this hospital. Actually, the risk is probably higher than if I just stayed home. Not only do I run the risk of dying if I go to hospital, I also have to pay for the privilege. So, of course, patients changed their behaviour. They decided, mm, I'll take my chances, thanks very much. Doctors saw that there was an income drop and said, tell you what, let's keep this data amongst to ourselves. That's not good enough. So, and it's still not good enough. We need to be trusted with those data. We need, as patients and members of society, to be able to make informed decisions. Actually, doctors need to do that as well. And what we have seen in the experience for this, uh, in, in the UK is doctors have responded to that information by considering what they do, comparing their performance with one another, and improving their care as a consequence. That is a good thing. 
In these days, we suffered as a result of going to hospital because, people, because you had a very high risk of dying, and we also suffered financially as a consequence. Fortunately, nowadays, that isn't the case in many countries around the world. Nowadays, we do have a national health service. We have universal health coverage. We have universal health coverage in many countries around the world. The first place was, was uh, Norway, 1912. In UK, we got the National Health Service just after the Second World War. After the Second World War, my grandparents' generation decided that having universal health coverage was worthwhile. After the Second World War, our towns and cities were devastated. We didn't have schools. We didn't have shops with food in. And yet, my, my grandparents' generation said, what we need is universal health coverage. They didn't say it's really expensive and we can't afford it, even though we've got all these other priorities, road building and so on and so forth. What they said is, we cannot afford not to have a National Health Service. And today, we still get claims that the National Health Service is unproductive and a waste of money. It is not. It's extremely valuable. And we should be rightly proud of it and defend what it gives us. Because the National Health Service means that if we go to hospital, we don't face financial catastrophe as a consequence. And many countries in the world have followed the example of Norway in 1912 and done the same. Most recently, Argentina in 2016. Other countries are doing the same. China is moving towards universal health coverage. India is moving towards universal health coverage. This is a great thing. One of the great things about this movement is that many of the people who have worked at the LSE and studied at the LSE over the years have contributed to this movement and they have contributed to making the world a better place in terms of health and well-being of the population the world over. What is great about the LSE is that 70% of students in this institution are from outside of the UK. This is a truly global institution that has a global impact on lives everywhere through the years since it's been founded and looking forward. Looking forward because you are all here today from countries all over the world. And when you finish studying here at the LSE, you will return to your countries and make things better. You've done that already in your careers, you're going to do it even more. Because that is what the LSE does. It empowers people and informs people to make the world a better place. So I am truly grateful that you are all here at LSE. I'm truly grateful that you have come tonight and I'm truly grateful that you have welcomed me among you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. And I have to say, on behalf of uh, many colleagues at the LSE, we are truly grateful you decided to come and join us. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Right, let's take some questions, and we'll take three questions at a time. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand and perhaps just introduce yourself briefly. Madam, please. Sorry, do wait for the uh, so, microphone. I'm Helen, I'm a biomedical scientist. Um, your mum asked you the question, will I feel better? Well, it seems to me it was like a 50-50 chance whether she'd feel better or not. So, um, was the answer satisfactory? I'll take, yeah, take three now. We have another question there. Did uh, I'm a retired person. But the, the problem that you're talking about, or that he was talking about, it, with regard to special interests, they operate everywhere. 
and the, it's, a, it's a universal problem, whether it's banking, education, medicine, you always get this problem. And in a sense, if you can solve that problem, or at least attempt to solve it, then really we might be going, getting better, but until you do, I don't think you will. Thank you. There's another question in that segment of the population. Uh, the uh, lady beside the uh, chap with the green uh, top. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Genevieve. I'm studying maths and physics. I've got a question sort of in regards to does hospital feel better and make you feel better? Sort of more looking at the mental health sector and would uh, more with the economic background, does that hospital admission actually work or is it more costly on the NHS to be waiting for interventions until it gets to hospital stages? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. So, Helen, um, you suggested that um, a 50-50 uh, wasn't great. Now, that was just on one of the measures. That was 50% that was on... 50% said that their mobility didn't improve. On the overall, though, on the other things for my mother, most people said they got better overall. So, in her case, she felt that was worthwhile. She felt it was worthwhile going forward. Of course, you might have different... You might value your mobility differently to my mother. With, and, that, and then the result would might for you to say, well, I'm not going to take a 50-50 chance on mobility. I'm not so worried about my self-care or usual activities and so on. You downplay those aspects. But actually, it's up to you. Because what you can do, of course, is fill in the questionnaire for yourself. And then you can decide how you, much weight you attach to each of those different dimensions. So for my mother, she acted on that information and decided, yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Other people might not have done but they can go ahead on the basis of information and their own particular preferences. We always, there are, the world is full of special interests, of course. We're subject to forces and, and that we don't even understand or even observe. Um, I think one of our defenses amongst those, uh, against those special, in, uh, special interests is, as Florence Nightingale said, to collect infor information and analyse it and not just rely on the force of argument and hearsay and anecdote. And that was what was inspiring about Florence Nightingale. She was able to stand up to for, uh, special interests and very vested interests and powerful lobby groups. The British Army is quite an organisation to deal with. The, the House of Parliament are, are full of fairly robust people. She was able to convince people to do things differently and change behaviour for the benefit of people that she cared about because she marshalled her arguments and based those arguments on evidence rather than just shouting at one another. Of course, there will always be special interests, but I think if we can provide a more evidence-based set of arguments we will be in a much better position than if we weren't. Um, in terms of... Um, um, uh, what was the question? Is it more... Sorry, where are you? You've hidden away. Uh, sorry, can you just say, repeat the last question again? Uh, so, is it... Uh, what are your views on sort of the cost and oh, on, the, on waiting, waiting times, times and so on? Yeah. Is it more beneficial to um, wait until patients are in crisis need and then need hospital admission, or is it better to sort of roll out and offer early intervention to all? Yeah. So there's a couple of things there. One is what weight you attach to different objectives. Is it more important that you make people better or, or reduce their waiting time? So that's one aspect to that question. The techniques that I've shown you here actually don't attach weight to anything. You can just look at each dimension independently. Many other scorecards for hospitals sort of add them up in some way, which does require a weighting. But the technique that we've used here doesn't require you to add a weight. And adding weights is really hard because people value things very differently. Governments value things differently to doctors. Doctors value things differently to patients. So this idea that we'd have a common set of weights that we all agree to 
is completely impossible. So as a consequence, looking at things independently and separately, but recognizing there's some relationship between them, avoids the problem of having, a weight, um, having weights. The other weights are about how long you wait, rather than WAIT. If you wait longer for surgery, will you do worse or will you do better? Um, and it depends. For some types of intervention, for urology for example, the advice is will engage in watchful waiting given your underlying diagnosis. For other things, you need to be treated straight away. If you suffer a stroke, that's what need, you need to get an ambulance, you need to be seen, and you need to get to a hyperstroke unit as quickly as possible. So it really depends. And of course, policy and guidance and organizational uh, forms are structured in such a way that allow uh, our responses to help people's healthcare problems to be appropriate to their under, underlying circumstances and conditions. Okay, let's turn to this wing of the uh, room. Gentlemen in the... Uh Hello, thank you. Hi, I'm Girish Palnipka, cardiothoracic anaesthetist from Canberra, Australia. I just wanted to add to that. Actually, there's Hang good on, data. You're here to ask questions, not to answer them. Okay, well. So very briefly, please. There's good data in Australia that shows that if you wait longer, the worse you get, and that's because your comorbidities worsen over time. How long that is is um, up for debate, but uh, usually over a year, you find that your comorbidities worsen and you become a higher risk. And, uh, um, some of the, the countries that you've shown here has adopted universal health coverage at the constitutional level, yep. but has not yet gone into data gathering and transparency in healthcare. Yep. So in that dichotomy, if you had to choose or recommend what is more important, to have universal health coverage in a constitution or data transparency for better patient quality of life and productivity of the healthcare system. Fine. Do we have another question from this side? Lady in this room, thank you. Hi, uh, Talithia McBride from the United States. Um, so I enjoyed hearing this use of patient reported outcome data. I'm just wondering if there, um, do you field patient reported surveys or tools in a way so that the information is shared with the surgical center or the physicians that would then change how they deliver care so that they understand what's of value to the patient. Okay. So I take those then? Okay. So, so Luis, uh, the first, I don't want to make a choice between universal health coverage and data transparency. It is true, actually, that um, many, of, many countries that have health insurance systems actually have better data. And actually, that's because it's much more important for running those insurance type arrangements than they have data, because all the transactions between insurers and hospitals rely upon them. Um, so data is probably better in those contexts than in countries with universal health coverage where it's not quite so important. Um, but those data in those contexts are usually private. They're usually kept to the insurers or the hospitals rather than being shared at regional or national level. I believe in transparency and I think that helps. Um, and I also think societies are better off if we care and financially support people who are vulnerable and unwell. So I think universal health coverage is something that societies should, should move towards. So I don't really want to make a trade-off, but I recognise in universal health, countries with universal health coverage, data improvements can be made. So I want to make sure that happens. Um, Talithia, you suggest, uh, suggested that there are different PROMS measures. There are. There are many different instruments that are used. And there are many ways that the data can be shared. What's absolutely critical is that those data are anonymized between researchers and, and policy makers. So we don't have any idea about who has filled in uh, in the information. So pseudonymization or anonymization is absolutely critical for research perspective. Of course, those who should have access to the identifiable data are the patients and those the patient trusts to care for them. But for the rest of us, we don't need to know exactly who that person is. 
We can use data that are anonymised to be able to identify problems and good practice. And proms are another way of looking at the world. And I think it's an important way because why do we go to, go to hospital? We go to hospital to make ourselves, hopefully, to get better. And if we don't collect data on whether or not we get better or not, we actually don't really know if the, if the healthcare sector is fulfilling its primary function. So there is a challenge to make sure data are appropriate, shared uh, sensibly and securely, but we can overcome those problems to ensure that the health systems are challenged and improve for the benefit of all of us. Right, questions from this, uh, right at the back. Yes, please. Wait for the microphone, please. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Bella. I'm your student. <laughs> um, but how can you mitigate issues of patient reported health outcomes in systems that are for profit? So, where admitting a patient is more. Sorry, in terms of. In, term in settings where admitting patients is more of a profit seeking activity rather than a in in way to improve their health. So, like in the United States, um, many patients are admitted to the ER for just minor wounds. Yeah. Um, and they don't come out feeling any better with any better improvement in their overall health. Rather, it's just the wound that was fixed. So how can you mitigate issues of reporting feeling better for the wound but not feeling better overall? So, you haven't, so the, idea, the question is you don't have a pre-treatment measure? Yeah. Because they might be unconscious when they come in, right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Can you just pass the microphone on? Thank you, sir. Hi, um, Abdulaziz from Saudi. Uh, my question is, do you think if uh, the questionnaire was constructed in a different way, uh, could it give uh, a worse result? Like it, it's not intended to, or the, the same result that it was showing to yep. the patient? Okay. Yep. And the third question, oh, this lady with the white uh, scar. Thank you very much. Um, so if you had a simple answer, you probably would have already told us, but what do you, you kind of see as the next steps to fix this quality problem? Is it just making more data available in more conditions? Yep. Or is there some other you know, kind of system level solution that you think needs to be yep. implemented? Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, so the first question is about a particular population of patients who, go to, uh, who are in hospital, people who basically um, arrive unconscious and obviously can't fill in a pre-treatment um, um, questionnaire um, and that's very challenging. Essentially what we have, the, the measures that we've adopted in England um, are ones where it's pretty, it's, 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 you certainly can get a pre-treatment and a post-treatment uh, survey and, and that's, so those have been adopted for a variety of reasons and rolled out in England basically because it's feasible. But there are big challenges in, um, in ER pa um, emergency patients which the research community and the medical community still needs to resolve. There are me ways of measuring outcomes post having a stroke and so on and so forth but we still need to be able to figure out how to do that in the absence of pre-treatment types of, of health instruments, okay? So, and I, I think, you know, we, we've, we, we uh, apply these instruments and different instruments in lots of clinical trial settings uh, to look at patients with very different profiles. Um, and if we can do that there, essentially we have the technology. The question is, why are we only applying that technology in clinical trial settings, but not in routine practice? Only about 2% of patients who go to hospital, 2% uh, of patients who go to hospital get enrolled in clinical trials, and they're very different from the, the rest of the patients. So we, we do have the technology to ask people about their experience or to measure their experience in some way, shape, or form. We still don't do it routinely. So I think we need to meet that challenge. It's a difficult challenge. Um, that might keep you occupied throughout your research career. So stick with it. Um, Aziz, you said, you know, what happens if we diff use a different measure? Well, uh, in England, people filled in this questionnaire. They also filled in some condition-specific questionnaires that are just for hip replacement patients and just for hip knee replacement patients and just for people who have varicose vein room. There's loads of other instruments around. People make their whole careers devising new instruments to collect 
patient experience or measure health status. And lots of people argue about my instrument's better than yours and your instrument doesn't do this. And you, I don't care. Just collect some data and then we'll analyse it. We're able to collect these data and compare whether our results are sensitive to using one questionnaire to measure health status compared to another. And not really, they're not. It doesn't matter. Now you've only had one, you can't have another question, Aziz, I'm sorry. Third question was, what are the next steps? What are the big challenges facing our health services going forward? The big challenges in most of our countries, not all, but most of the countries that are represented here today, are those of an ageing population. People with multiple conditions who are having care provided partly in hospitals, but predominantly living in home, maybe moving into care homes eventually, um, but by a whole group of different people who are providing different aspects of their care. Some people are helping manage their diabetes, others their asthma, others their hypertension, others their heart condition, others their dementia. The big problems many of us face is how do we ensure that the care that they receive is packaged in such a way that the person receiving it gets the care they need at the right time and in the right place? and that care package is really benefiting the patients that are experiencing it. It's much more difficult to measure the health outcomes of interventions for people with long-term conditions and chronic conditions because their care might not necessarily be about making them better but stabilising them condition and helping them live full lives and they're receiving a whole host of different interventions for a whole host of different conditions. So that's one of the big challenges that we all face and we're only just beginning to get to grips with at the moment. Now I've got uh, three quiet questions for Andrew to consider because I know he's going out to dinner with the family and I want to know what time I bring the proceedings to a close. But I think we have an opportunity to have three questions from this part of the hall and we have in the second row, thank you very much. So I'm Steve, I'm a pulmonary critic. Wait for a second while Andrew answers these questions. These are very important okay. questions. Yeah, exactly. So you okay? Yes and yes. Right. Okay. Far away. Far away. So Steve, I'm a Sorry, pulmonary Steve. critical care physician in the United States. What are your thoughts on using patient reported outcomes for physician compensation and how that drives the equation or drives healthcare. Okay. Uh, gentleman with his hand touching the ceiling. I'm Daniel, and 20 years ago when I read social policy, I thought the um, inverse care law was a um, quite con quaint concept. And um, now uh, with various health problems and a mother with um, dementia and 12% of over 65s with um, dementia and rising um, isn't your hope misplaced in a time of austerity? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Do I see a question there? But just behind. I'm a knee replacement recipient. I wouldn't say beneficiary, anyway, recipient. Um, I've got two questions which are related. One is, are you concerned that the, most of the measures that you're using are subjective measures rather than objective measures? And related to that is that, is there any input to the motivation of patients? That's particularly important, I think, in the case of hip replacements and knee replacements. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so the first question is about in critical care, um, or actually in general, should patients be paid more if, if, um, if they're better at getting patients better? So this is a general question about pay for performance. Um, does pay for performance in the healthcare sector make a difference? To, does it, is, is it worth the effort? The evidence on that is still equivocal. We still don't really know. 
there have been a number of paid performance initiatives of a variety of types uh, that have been introduced around the world, some of which have been tied to outcomes. There's not a huge amount of pay that is attached to many of these pay for performance schemes, so it only accounts usually in the compensation amount for a tiny proportion of physician or hospital income. Um, and at the moment, it's still unclear whether that has an, a beneficial effect on, on outcomes. So really, the jury's out. In England, there was an idea that you would do this for, for, for these outcome measures, for PROMs, that hospitals with patients that reported better outcomes would get paid more. That didn't happen. What happened, uh, uh, what's happening at the moment is that hospitals are rewarded for getting more responses because... Hospitals have, and treatment centres have to administer these, but it's voluntary for patients to participate. But hospitals can be better or worse at asking people to fill the questionnaires in. So in England at the moment, this is used to encourage participation rather than having the, their funding related to the outcomes themselves. But other aspects are rewarded according to performance. So for readmission rates, for example, there are penalties if you have high readmission rates. And that encourages hospitals to say, why have we got high readmission rates? Let's do something about it. In the idea that financial incentives might motivate them to work more carefully. But I'm not sure that's really the motivating thing. I actually think just making this information publicly available or available to the people who might do something about it is usually inf incentive enough. So just getting the information and sharing it is the most important thing. Daniel, you asked about the inverse care law, which basically means that parts of the country that are already badly off Retent people in those parts of the country where there is low, poorer funding and where um, care is already poor gets worse over time. So, you know, if you're in a bad position, it's a vicious uh, spiral downwards. Has it got worse under austerity? Yeah. Things have got worse under this program of austerity. Um, and they've got worse in parts of the country that were already not doing particularly well. Austerity has been harmful for people's health in this country. Uh, we have longer waiting times. Um, care is not as... Uh, compared to what the health systems could have been doing over the last few years, um, there have been constraints on the amount of money that's been made available to the healthcare sector. The, mo the ma money made available to the healthcare sector has grown much more slowly over the last seven to eight years than it has over the history of the National Health Service. And to some extent, the health service has responded to that um, restricted funding environment but trying to do things better by becoming more productive. It is treating more patients now than it was seven years ago. More patients are being treated. Um, it's become much more productive over time. People who work in the health service are working harder. They're working longer hours, they're working more efficiency, efficiently. But at some stage that runs out. At some stage you get staff burnout, and you get people leaving the health system to work elsewhere. We're already seeing that. It's partly a consequence of austerity. It's partly a consequence of wages being frozen. It's partly now a consequence of our policy regarding our membership of the European Union. And so the opportunities for the health system to continue under a really tight budget over the next few years are much worse than they were five or six years ago because most of the opportunities to become more efficient have, been, have run out. The government, to its credit, has now recognised this and is now promising to fund uh, the health service a bit more generously than it has over the last five to seven years, um, both the healthcare sector and the social care sector. But again, as I said in my presentation, we cannot take our health services for granted. And we cannot take the funding that we apply to the health services for, gra for granted. We need to defend these services that our grandparents fought to establish after the Second World War. Um, and finally, I'm not saying one measure is better than another. I'm not saying we should only use subjective measures and then ignore objective measures. Measures measure different things. 
Um, they're picking up different aspects of the care process. They're picking up different aspects of people's experience of those that care process, whether that is the experience that clinicians have of what they think their parents are, um, uh, how their care is progressing for their patients, or whether the patients are feeding back their, um, their experience to their clinicians. I think everybody's views on how the care process can be, is, is going, and how it can be improved are valuable. So the more information that we have certainly by the people who are the users of the healthcare system, that has to be valuable information. It's useful to know how you felt as a result of your knee replacement. Could it have been done better? We don't know that unless you tell somebody, right? You might have had a terrible experience, it might have been fine, you might have seen some aspects of your care that could have been improved. If you don't tell us, if you don't tell people who work in the healthcare system, we don't know and it won't get better. If our students don't fill in surveys about how our teaching was and what could be done better, we can't improve our teaching practice. If we don't critique one another and share information about what we feel about things, subjectively, or objectively, none of us are going to get better in any of the things that we do. And I think we want to all get better and do better jobs, whether we're in the healthcare sector or the education sector. Right, Andrew, thank you very much. Now, before I thank Andrew and you, the audience, can I just inform you that there is a reception which is being held in the Garrick uh, Bar. If you come out of this building and turn right and walk up to the Kingsway, it's, uh, the Garrick Bar is on the corner of uh, Houghton Street, the main entrance to the school. So please uh, come along and continue the discussion uh, over a glass of wine. Andrew, thank you very much for a very um, stimulating and sparkling address, and I'm sure your mother will be delighted at the uh, contribution <laughs> to, um, to, 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 to this uh, scholarship. So thank you very, very much. much. Thank you.